Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you to our 2018 Hoyt C. Hoddle Lecture. It's my great pleasure to tell you about uh, the Hoyt Hoddle Lectureship and about uh, its namesake, uh, Professor Hoyt C. Hoddle, uh, who was a member of our faculty for many years. Hoyt came to MIT from Indiana in 1922 at the age of 19, having just received his bachelor's in chemistry from Indiana University. He also received his master's in chemical engineering uh, and, uh, and from the uh, Walt Whitman School and uh, later got his PhD at MIT. He became the assistant director of the practice school Buffalo Station and uh, later, after serving that role in our chemical engineering practice school, uh, became the assistant professor of fuel and gas engineering here at MIT. Uh, he later became the Carbon P. Dubs Professor of Chemical Engineering, which was the role he held until his retirement in 1968. Uh, even after his uh, retirement, he remained active in the department until his death in 1998. And in general, he was a really central figure here at MIT, and particularly in our Department of Chemical Engineering for over 75 years. Now, his major theme was energy research. Hoyt Hoddle was remembered for his intensity, intellect, and integrity, and, his, uh, and being a proponent for the use of multiple forms of energy. His lectures, lectures aimed to make students think. He made seminal contributions to the measurement of gas emissivity. He established the mathematical framework for the quantitative treatment of furnaces, the first systematic investigation of laminar to turbulent transition in diffusion flames, and explored heterogeneous combustion and this was at an early age when this was a very new area in our field. Hoyt Hoddle was the co-founder with Bernard Lewis and A.J. Narod of the Combustion Institute, which ultimately became an international institute. And then he was elected into the uh, National Academy of Science in 1963, the National Academy of Engineering in 1974, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His professional awards include uh, the U.S. Medal of Merit, the King's Medal for Service, in the cause of freedom from Great Britain. The Founders Award, which one of, is one of our highest awards in the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, as well as several additional awards throughout his career has been recognized. Now, just a little bit about Hoyt Hoddle's interests. They were very broad, and when I get to the introduction of our speaker, you'll see why he's a perfect choice uh, for today's seminar. He had a broad interest in energy, uh, and was, in fact, interested in forms of energy that still remain relevant to this day. He was interested in sustainability and in climate discussions. With funding from Godfrey L. Cabot in 1938, he organized the, the world's first solar energy utilization research center. And this was back in 1930s. The studies led to the choice of a flat plate collector as the most promising device for solar heating, development of the performance predicting e equations that are in use today, for assessing such collectors and for testing new concepts. Construction of the first solar heated house. And here you have a picture of this uh, solar heated house back in 1939, um, which uh, also led to a great deal of additional research and uh, three others which provided data for economic assessment of solar energy and solar space heating, solar hot water supplies. Professor Hoddle maintained a balanced view of the significance of solar energy in the national and world energy use advocating for separation of emotional from logical inputs to the assessment of the prospects for the economic use of the sun as an energy source. So he was a true pioneer and a very imaginative and creative person. And our speaker today is also a pioneer, a very imaginative person. I'm very excited to introduce Professor Stephen Chu. Stephen Chu is the William R. Keenan Professor of Physics and Professor of Molecular and Cellular Physiology in the Medical School at Stanford University. He's published over 280 papers in atomic physics, polymer physics, biophysics, biology, biomedical imaging, nanoparticle material synthesis, batteries, and other energy technologies. So as I mentioned, a huge breath. He holds 10 patents and has 11 more patent filings since 2015. Uh, Professor Chu was born in St. Louis, Missouri with ancestry from Jiangsu, China, and graduated from Garden City High School, he received a BA in mathematics and a bachelor's in physics in 1970 from the University of Rochester. 
He went on to earn his PhD in physics from Berkeley under Eugene D. Commons in 1976. Uh, Professor Chu comes from a family of scholars. In fact, his father, Zhu Chen Chu, is an alumnus of our department in chemical engineering. So welcome home. <laughs> he earned a doctorate in chemical engineering from MIT in 1946, and Hermann Meissner was his advisor, another one of our very well-known uh, forefathers in our department. Uh, and he taught at, the Washing at Washington University in St. Louis and at Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute. Professor Chu's mother studied economics, and his older brother, Gilbert Chu, is currently a professor of biochemistry and medicine at Stanford University. So very interesting family dinners, I'm sure, all the time. Now, after obtaining his PhD at Berkeley, uh, Professor Chu remained as a postdoc for two years before joining Bell Labs, where he and several co-workers carried out his Nobel Prize-winning laser cooling work. Chu's early research focused on atomic physics by developing laser cooling techniques in the magneto-optical trapping of atoms using lasers. He and his co-workers at Bell Labs developed a way to cool atoms by employing six laser beams opposed in pairs and arranged in three directions at right angles to each other. Trapping atoms with this method allowed scientists to study individual atoms with great accuracy. And uh, for this work, uh, he received the Nobel Prize. He left Bell Labs and became a professor of physics at Stanford in 1987, serving as the chair of its physics department from 1990 to 1993, and from 1999 to 2001. He came back for it again. At Stanford, Professor Chu and three others initiated the BioX program, which focuses on interdisciplinary research in biology and medicine and played a key role in securing the funding for the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. In August of 2004, Chu was appointed as the director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Here we have him uh, talking to the then governor of the state in his role as uh, director. He joined UC Berkeley's Department of Physics and the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. Under his leadership, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab has been a center of research into renewable and other forms of clean energy technologies. He spearheaded the, the laboratory's Helios project, an initiative to develop methods of harnessing solar power as a source of renewable energy for transportation. At Stanford, Chu's research interests expanded into biological physics and polymer physics at the single molecule level. So this breadth led to study of other areas. He studied enzyme activity and protein and RNA folding using techniques like fluorescence resonance energy transfer, uh, AFM, and optical tweezers. His polymer physics research used individual DNA molecules to study polymer dynamics and their phase transitions. He continued researching atomic physics as well and developed new methods of laser cooling and trapping. So this very broad range of areas reflects very well on the kinds of technologies we investigate in our own department. In fact, we welcome you here at MIT. Chris's Chu's um, nomination to be Secretary of Energy was unanimously confirmed, and he was sworn in as Secretary of Energy in the Barack Obama administration on January 21, 2009. As the first scientist to hold a cabinet position and the longest serving energy secretary, he recruited outstanding scientists and engineers into the Department of Energy. He began several initiatives that we're quite familiar with, including ARPA-E, the Energy Innovation Hubs, and the annual Clean Energy Ministerial Meetings, which began in 2009. And he was personally tasked by, Professor, by President Obama to assist, to assist British Petroleum in stopping the Deepwater Horizon oil leak. Finally, on February 1, 2013, Chu announced his intent to resign. In his resignation announcement, he warned of the risks of climate change from continued reliance on fossil fuels and wrote, the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. We, tr we transitioned to better solutions. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our very distinguished uh, Professor Stephen Chu. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Wow, you really did your homework. Um, <laughs> so um, let me just say that um, I, there's another brother. Um, uh, of the, there are three brothers. Um, uh, the uh, other brother, the younger brother, I'm the middle brother. The younger brother is the smart brother. <laughs> uh, he, um, 
he didn't graduate from high school. That's not why he's smart. He bummed around. He had a fly-on with the parents, the school, everything. Talked his way into UCLA. Got a PhD at 21 or 22. Went on to get a law degree. Um, and then went on to be one of the leading intellectual property rights lawyers, litigators in, in the United States. So, um, so it's... Um, uh, so when I got the Nobel Prize, I felt, whew, that leveled the playing field in my family. <laughs> <laughs> I only had a PhD in physics. My younger brother, a law degree, uh, two, so two law degrees and a PhD. My older brother, a PhD in physics and an MD PhD. Uh, and so, so it was bad. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so what I'd like to talk to you about is um, something near and dear to my heart, and that is climate change and uh, what we really need to do to shift to a sustainable future. And the good news is there are things we can do and things that uh, are dependent on even further technology development. All right, so let's talk about the one and a half degrees or two degree goals of the UN uh, and also where we're heading. So just to remind you very quickly, this is the temperature, average temperature of the surface of the ocean and land, 1850, 2017. Remarkably, most people would look at this and say, hmm, the temperature seems to be increasing. Um, <laughs> why do I say remarkably? I'm looking, ah. Uh, because when I was in DC uh, in 2009 to 2013, they pointed to this plateau and said, no, it's not increasing. The climate scientists got it wrong. So there, there you have it. Uh, uh, and in any case, um, I do want to point out that most of this temperature rise occurred since 1975. It's a recent phenomenon. Um, uh, the annual emissions of uh, carbon dioxide have been growing over time. Uh, this is how it uh, divides into sectors of land use, including deforestation, coal, oil, gas, cement. Cement is now 5% of the carbon dioxide emissions in the world. Uh, and you say, that's very alarming. Uh, this seems to be a big jump, again, since about 1950. Uh, three quarters of all the carbon emissions have occurred since 1950. And so then you're wondering, but you need a longer term perspective of what carbon emissions have been doing. So here it is. Uh, this is from uh, 10,000 years ago to the present time, uh, and you need uh, more recent updating of the data, so here's where we are today. Okay, so on any geological time scale, on any even 1,000-year time scale, it just is essentially instantaneous. And the level in carbon dioxide increase uh, is consistent with what we know about the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions, and that is that um, roughly half of it gets absorbed very quickly by the land and oceans within a couple of years, uh, and the rest of it circulates around um, from between land oceans and the atmosphere. Uh, and so in terms of if you believe in arithmetic, then this rise has to do with humans. Uh, but if you don't want to believe in arithmetic, that's okay, too. Or not really, but that's... Uh. <laughs> now, since, since in the last, since uh, the turn of the century, a little bit alarming stuff. This is some satellite data of Antarctica. Uh, you use satellites to measure changes in the acceleration due to gravity, and it perturbs the orbit of the satellite, and you can back calculate what the change in mass is. This was very surprising because this means just loss of mass. This means an increase in mass. And Antarctica, in a warmer world, was supposed to increase in ice mass because when it snows in Antarctica, it's so cold that it, it, it just stays there and accumulates. And so unbalanced, what they found it was a decrease in, in ice mass. Now, another thing you should know is um, that as a matter of history, if you look at the last warm glacial period, which was only one degree warmer than today, which is the two degree limit, and this is the last warm period, uh, we, there's a fossil record. Uh, when, where were the sea levels based on uh, when seashell critters that died and got fossilized 
around the world, not just in one spot, um, where were they? How far above or below land were they? And the answer was um, the sea level was six to nine meters higher than today. Not centimeters, meters. Now, more than 10% of the world lives within uh, 10 meters of sea level. And so that means um, those people will be displaced. But we thought, hmm, how long would it take to get to this new steady state? Well, there is no real steady state, but then, you know, and, and we thought it would take uh, several thousand years. But now this is all being rewritten in the last decade that we think maybe not. The estimates from IPC are steadily rising um, and maybe a meter uh, this century, but it's very nonlinear. And so in the next century, a couple of meters. So we're now talking, we're really thinking a couple of meters, two, three meters uh, uh, in 130 years, 170 years, something like that. So again, very different than what we thought uh, just a little while back. All right, so uh, we see aquifers around the world being depleted. And this is a very serious issue. Um, in California, where I live, uh, the water supply system is both in underground aquifers, but it's mainly in snowfall that lands in the Sierra Nevadas. And then that slowly melts until through June, July, August. And it's held back by the dams. And so what we uh, see is happening is there are going to be more spring rains, not spring snows. The dam system cannot hold all that water, so it just will spill over the dams. And so we uh, anticipate uh, perennial droughts. We've been through a very bad drought in the last four years. We're kind of out of it now, but uh, it's still seen that. We, uh, there are now two seasons on the West Coast. It's called the rainy season and the fire season. It used to be the fire season was only a few months, and now it's, it's eight months. Uh, and so, so that's a real issue, uh, water shortages, forest fires, crop fires. Uh, water shortages, or, uh, stressed areas around the world are outlined in red and orange. So, so these are things that we also see in satellite um, of drained aquifers in the entire western part of the United States, west of the Mississippi. The aquifers are being drained need more irrigation. More irrigation means, and more hotter summers mean you, uh, you're you draining the aquifers faster. And so this is also some of the consequences, the, the early warning signs of what we're seeing. All right, so let's talk about scenarios from where we are today, 2018. Um, this is the carbon emissions going forward and uh, what you need to be. And so here is a, this does depend on climate models. There are very large uncertainties in these climate models. Uh, but having said that, uh, the most models say if you want to reach the UN target of below 2 degrees, which is here, the emissions have to essentially turn over now and plunge. And what does zero mean? That means all the carbon emission of the world from electricity, transportation, process heat, you name it has to go negative, negative, OK, by 2070. The projections are by 2070, we may uh, plateau, <laughs> all right? And so, so if you take a scenario that sort of looks like this in this mid-range, uh, we're not going to be ending up in a good spot. So again, from this is from the IPCC. Last full report, this is uh, climate models predict it's 2,900 gigatons of carbon. These are the uncertainties. These are sort of the quantum one sigma uncertainties. So they could be very much bigger than that. It could be down here. It could be way up here. There's a long tail. Um, so if you took that middle scenario that I showed you, uh, we're over here, all right? Uh, that's three and uh, three-quarter degrees. Um, Remember, two degrees was six to nine meters higher. So just let that sink in. And so we don't really, there are lots of things that we're not very sure of what happens at higher temperatures, but certainly there's a great worry once you're in this range over here that you can get to 
the probability of getting to a tipping point, for example, the release of methane that's been storing for years and centuries and even millennia in the northern land masses in uh, Russia and Canada and Alaska will be released. And that would mean that would dwarf the carbon emissions for the last half century by a lot. And so, so again, it puts us on a different scale because if that methane gets released, uh, it's in a very positive feedback circuit, and, and so that's happening. Already we see positive, strong positive feedbacks in the Arctic Ocean melting, absorbing more energy, and already um, countries jockeying for position in news, who's going to have the trade uh, in the North Pole area because it's, it, is, it is open in the summer now, uh, and increasingly in larger parts of the year, it will be open for shipping. Okay, okay so uh, the other thing I want to point out, uh, this is 1750, 2100, uh, that it's cumulative emissions that count, not the yearly emissions. Why? Because remember, half the car roughly half the carbon dioxide circulates. Half of it uh, gets absorbed, and the rest of it circulates, but what's the time constant for circulation? It gets absorbed by trees in photosynthesis, for example. The trees live, they die, they get recycled by microbes, and they're reprocessed as CO2 and methane, and it just circulates around. Similar circulation patterns in the ocean, many time constants. But the half-life is roughly 10,000 years. So don't think 2100. Think 21000 as the half-life for damage that we do, OK? You've slipped over another decimal point. And so that, for that reason, it is cumulative emission. And so and again, this is the two degree uh, goal. Uh, if we don't increase in carbon dioxide emission, but just continue where we are, we pass that in 30 years. But we're increasing. Uh, and so a, uh, the founder of Taoism, uh, this is where we are. Uh, but the founder of Taoism uh, was reputed to have said, if you don't change direction, you will end up where you're heading. Now, that's something Yogi Berra could have said easily. <laughs> and then I looked up, did he really say this? And I was finding Yogi Berra. No, I, I don't know whether he really said this. <laughs> but anyway, it's a nice story. <laughs> OK, again, uh, the cumulative emissions since the last 65 years, it's a recent phenomenon. You don't have to go back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So where does this stuff come from, uh, the carbon dioxide? So 1970, 2010, this is uh, carbon dioxide from fossil fuels, industrial processes, electricity generation. This is carbon dioxide from forestry and land use. This is methane, of which the at least half, probably 2 thirds, are from agriculture. Uh, this darker thing is uh, N2O, and that's actually from agriculture, primarily a lion's share of it uh, because of fertilizer runoffs. Uh, and then little squiggles here and there of uh, fluorine gases. So, so that's where it's coming from. Amazingly, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions uh, from agriculture, forestry, and other land use is actually twice that of transportation and a little bit higher than electricity generation around the world. So it is actually some of the lower hanging fruit in terms of what we can do about it. If you look at, uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit, remind you of geoengineering. When people say geoengineering, we really shouldn't do geoengineering. I want to emphasize, too late, it's been done for about a few thousand years. Um, this is the whole land surface. This is the surface land is over here, from here to here. Ocean is out to here, because there's seven times more ocean than land, land on the surface of the Earth. Of this land, this is the habitable land. So we don't, you know, the um, Sahara Desert, we will say, is non-inhabitable. The Rocky Mountains, uh, non-inhabitable. So you carve out this. So this is all the land. This is the habitable land. This is forest. This is agriculture. And of, so look, of the habitable land, we're actually using half. <laughs> That's a lot. And then of that, it's livestock for grazing and agriculture. All right, so, so it is massive geoengineering. And, and now if you look at where the carbon mass is on the Earth, what you find is most of it is in plants. 
Uh, and the biggest error bar is bacteria because they're harder to see and measure in the soils. And then over here in this little triangle is animals. And you blow up the little animal section, okay? So it's mostly plants and bacteria. Blow up the animals, and what you find is the biggest one are arthropods and fish. What are arthropods? Just to remind you, these are invertebrates like spiders and insects, uh, things with external segmented bodies. They include uh, crustaceans, millipedes. Fish, you know what fish are. Um, <clears throat> Uh, also point out that 33% of the world's fish stocks are estimated to be overexploited. Most of the big fish are missing now. Uh, that's an issue. Uh, and now, okay, so you know, spiders and insects and millipedes uh, and all these other things. And so where are the lions and tigers and bears? All right, they're here. This is livestock, this is humans. That's wild, the rest of the mammals. So the amount of uh, biomass due to human intervention is 23 times that of all the rest of the mammals. Again, to impress upon you the fact that we have really geoengineered the planet. <clears throat> all right, so that's where we are and where we're heading. What are the new technologies? Uh, <clears throat> and then, as pointed out in my introduction, uh, our ability to keep and find and extract oil and natural gas is going to continue. The technology for finding oil and gas for getting out of the ground economically is increasing almost as fast as solar and wind. And so um, I think we will not run out, even with the current increasing rates of uh, use of oil and natural gas, I don't think we're going to run out by the end of this century and, and even into the next century. And so the quote, I'm quoting Sheikh Yamani, who is the former Saudi oil minister, and he said, the Stone Age came to an end, not for lack of stones, and the Oil Age will end, but not for lack of oil. Now, that's not why he's the former Saudi oil minister. <laughs> um, uh, what he meant was you transition to better solutions. And so what that means is that when you go from the Stone Age to Metal Ages of various kinds, uh, that's OK. This, you don't look at the stones and say, you know, if it weren't for government regulators, we wouldn't have these stranded assets. <laughs> Not every stone has to be turned into an arrowhead, a plow, or this or that. OK, and so the uh, corollary to this is if you don't find better solutions, which, of course, include money. And energy is all about money, about 99.9% .9 so far in terms of society value. It's money only. Uh, if you don't find better solutions, the oil and gas will come out of the ground. If you're the head of a country that has many trillions of dollars of wealth underneath the ground, you just have to pump it out, what is the temptation to do? You pump it out. And so there's an incredible correlation between those countries that have rich natural resources in terms of oil and gas and their views on climate change. Their countries that have rich sources of oil and natural gas have very mixed views on climate change. Um, and whereas the ones who don't seem to have a clear-eyed view, or at least to me a clear-eyed view, but it, they may think I have a distorted view. But anyway, um, so let me talk about food, because that's a big deal, because agriculture is a big contributor to greenhouse gas. And so I also want to point out that we've been genetically modifying plants and animals for over 4,000 years. So in addition to geoengineering, we've actually been gene engineering for many, many years. Okay, And so you have to put that in the context of the fears of genetically modified crops. Um, and what has happened recently in the last couple of decades, of course, is it has become more powerful. but it can play an incredible role in feeding the world population and actually diminishing the amount of greenhouse gases. And this energy, climate, food, water challenge is all becoming one and the same interlocked puzzle. Uh, let me remind you, uh, a fellow by the name of Norman Borlaug was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. And what he did is he took 
using conventional breeding methods, he uh, bred strains of wheat so that the wheat would grow really thick, heavy kernels of wheat compared to the other things, it was mostly roughage. And, but these things were so heavy that he had to breed in the plants so they're smaller, they're dwarf plants with thicker stems so they wouldn't keel over from their weight. And he also bred them so that if you had infusions of fertilizer and irrigation, they, their sudden spurts of growth would not make them keel over. So he did this. And um, what happened? So in 1960, the world population was 3 billion people. And by 2005, it was 6.5 billion. Uh, this is the amount of area put into grain production, wheat, rice, corn. This is the yield production in the world. So it went up fourfold, fivefold in India and Pakistan. And so it enabled um, the world to feed a rapidly growing population, more than doubling in this period of time. And so that's why in 1970, he was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize, because it delayed the onslaught of mass starvation. Um, what about going in the future? We're now 7.5 billion people. We're going to go to 10.5, 11, well, 9.5 billion by 2050, and uh, maybe peaking at 10 to 12. And this is the projection of the land use from 1980 to present and from present to 2050, nearly flat. Even though we're going to grow another roughly 2 billion people. Okay? And those people are going to be eating more because they will be wealthier. Okay? And they will be using a lot of that to raise animals because they are wealthier. <laughs> and so even though when you consider all those projections, this is an astounding thing because agriculture is also racing ahead. This is corn in the United States per acre. And you see it just goes shooting up like this. This is 20. That's 140, 160 bushels per acre. OK. Now, let me tell you about some new technologies that I'm excited about. Uh, it is possible to try to understand the relationships between the root systems in plants, such as corn, and uh, their interaction with microbial elements very near than the so-called rhyosphere. And what happens is a company called Pivot Bio has said, you know, if we can get the plants to talk to microbes, figure out which microbes uh, can talk back to the plants and release ammonia, and, uh, which is nitrogen-based. So the plant says, I'm hungry, feed me. Not like the, you know, what, what you know, feed me. No, that moves. No. So uh, anyway, uh, it and so this is something. And so they've actually begun in the microbes to replace the entire genetic systems. Uh, and the de novo built up a new one in hopes that it would last longer. Because if you do a little cutting and snipping and things, it turns out they revert back pretty quickly. Anyway, uh, this is very exciting. I'm not sure. Yes. Uh, it's being field tested today, and it will be commercially available in 2019. Corn that fixes its own nitrogen. Sugarcane fixes its own nitrogen. And uh, actually, you would want all the plants we eat to fix their own nitrogen, because that means, because actually, the making of ammonia that turns into urea that becomes fertilizer is a couple percent of the carbon emissions in the world. And so if you get these plants to fix their own nitrogen, this is standard nitrogen. These are much happier because the bacteria are feeding them when they're hungry. And it seems to work. The question is, you've got to get the farmers to want to pick this up because it's a money-making proposition to them. And so, but this is coming along uh, very nicely. Um, the real dream, and I called up the CEO of um, Pivot Bio and said, you know what we really want is it's harder biologically, but to turn these plants into perennials. A perennial is the following. Um, sugar canes are perennial. Grasses are perennials. So at the end of the growing season, it brings all the nutrients back into the roots of the soil. It says, you know, I'm going to go to sleep for a while, and next spring I'm going to wake up, and here we go again. And so you can last and have a vitality for 15, maybe even 20 years. So it's not only the nitrogen fertilizers, the phosphates, all the minerals, it's everything. With perennials, you're automatically no tillage. 
you've also got to go to essentially no tillage, low tillage. Because another thing that happened in the Industrial Revolution is when you went from humans and animals pulling plows to massive tractors, you can plow this deep. And when you plow this deep, you upset everything, including all the earthworms and everything. And so we've been doing massive carbon depletion in the soils. And so when you go to no tillage and begin to cultivate microbes and things, you stick in carbon back in the soil. And we're talking tens of gigatons to 100 gigatons of carbon you can actually sequester by making the soil more fertile. So again, you know, low-hanging fruit, but you've got to get the agricultural community of the world to wake up to that. What about animals? Well, we eat beef, pigs, broiled chickens, turkeys. We a number of other animals. I just selected those two. This full circle is the natural lifetime, let's say, of uh, a cow or a steer. And that's the natural lifetime. And this is the fraction of the time they go to slaughter. So believe it or not, these big, humongous beef that we slaughter are only between 18 and 24 months old. Okay, This is high industrialization of farm animals. Again, this is not natural. Um, pigs, 22 to 26 weeks. And the average weight of slaughter at that time is 280 pounds after 22 to 24 weeks of growth. Uh, broiler chickens, 40 days. Turkeys, 14 to 16 weeks for your average 14 pounder. The grocery store, 14 pounder. It, you know, the turkey used to weigh more than that. <laughs> it's missing some things. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, now well, let's talk about the carbon emissions of these animals. This is uh, methane, enteric means it has something to do with the digestive system. And so um, uh, mostly due to beef and dairy cows. And so it comes out both ends. Very, you can't take it in polite company anywhere because lots of methane coming out in the front end and the back end. Uh, this is the biggest source of greenhouse gas in agriculture is burping and farting, sorry. <laughs> Uh, applied manure, uh, and then it degrades into N2O, it releases atmosphere, norm, quote, artificial fertilizers, feed, and everything. So this is it, global species by emissions. I cut off some of the other things, like small hooved animals, goats and sheep. Uh, it goes on. But um, <clears throat> beef cattle, dairy cattle, this is in uh, gigatons per year. And so you're looking at uh, 4.6 gigatons of greenhouse gas equivalent per year. Okay, The denominator is um, CO2 emissions is 39, including all the greenhouse gases, roughly 49 gigatons. Okay, So cows and beef, five, five-ish. OK? Um, <clears throat> for that reason, there are a few people who care about this. And if instead of raising beef, especially beef, because on a per kilogram basis of protein, uh, you're, you're about uh, eight times worse than a chicken or a turkey or even a pig. Okay, So, um, so these are companies that just started, uh, or not just, but just uh, are. Uh, I know personally the founder of Impossible Foods. His name is Pat Brown. He used to be a professor in biochemistry at uh, Stanford, a Howard Hughes senior medical investigator. Um, so he wasn't straying off because he was unsuccessful in science. He called me up, I don't know, six years or seven years ago, and said, Steve, you inspired me. I've quit my job at Stanford. Oh, Pat, I didn't mean, you know, he, it was a co <laughs> he was a co-inventor of the gene chip, among other things. You know, he's not a slouch. And he said, no, 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 you, you devote a huge amount of your time to the climate energy problem. I'm going to do the same. I'm going to figure out how to replace beef with vegetable products. And this is his impossible burger. And he says, but I'm a biochemist. You know, I don't know about electricity and stuff. So I'm going to use chemistry to make a hamburger that um, uh, from uh, vegetable-derived stuff that's related to myoglobin and hemoglobin. Uh, you get the bloody taste. Uh, he puts in. Uh, 
uh, myosin filaments that's found in muscle act in myosin systems, but not because he wants a muscle texture. It's because when you heat up the myosin molecules, there releases fluid, and so the hamburger sizzles and really gets juicy. Uh, and uh, he can put in uh, proteins that you don't normally find in vegetables. You can do This is just chemistry, so it's, it's better for you. Uh, less, virtually no cholesterol, things like that. Lots of B vitamins, and there's um, perhaps not quite as uh, steep in chemistry, but a, a thing beyond meat burger. Um, so, um, in blind tasting tests, that I've had them several times, I haven't had this one, but I've had this one a couple times, you can't really tell that it's not a hamburger, unless you overcook it. But you shouldn't overcook hamburgers anyway. So, <laughs> but, but if it's medium rare, it, it really tastes good, and I've been told, I haven't had it, that it really makes a very good steak tartare. <laughs> which is really, you know, then you know you have quality beef. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some of the other animals. This is a domestic turkey. Remember, three and a half months before slaughter. All right. Um, now, these are how they're raised in high densities, but they're so heavy they can't mate. The males can't mount the females, so they're actually bred by artificial insemination. It's, again, an industrial process, all right? And, and by uh, 12 to 14 weeks, um, months, sorry, three and a half months, 12 to 14 weeks, they are um, they're 12 to 14 pounds. Um, so those are, those are uh, what we call bred turkeys, genetically modified turkeys. Let me remind you, that's a wild turkey. And to get to that size, you've got to be years old, not months old. And so we don't know how, in this picture, I don't know how old these wild turkeys are. I can only say, being a physicist, I know how old this wild turkey is. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> uh, energy, OK? <laughs> So let's talk about energy. So renewable, the good news is renewable energy around the world, this is called levelized cost, which means over the lifetime of the investment, what's the average cost of the electricity generated, including maintenance, capex, land use, everything. And in the best sites around the world, it's now less than two cents a kilowatt hour. You're in New England, you're probably paying, I'm guessing about 20, 25 cents a kilowatt hour for your residential electricity. Okay, but roughly an order of magnitude less. Uh, by the way, I want to tell you that in New England, you could have much cheaper electricity, but the energy politics are not making that happen. And by energy politics, I mean that people who have invested in electricity generating capacity in New England do not want cheap hydroelectric power from Canada to come here. Just so you know. <laughs> you can have your electricity cost, and it will be carbon free. But maybe you want to call up your senators and congressmen and talk about that. Uh, and costs are expected to decline below two cents a kilowatt hour in the best sites. So that means not solar in Great Britain or Germany. OK, it means solar in the best sites. It means wind in the best sites. Uh, why? Again, it's because of technology. Slow, Moore's law, continued incremental improvement over decades. This is a six megawatt turbine uh, that's being installed. Uh, and uh, they're figuring out how to install it so you can actually install it in reasonably high wind speeds. And it doesn't need calm seas. Uh, these things are big. That little red thing up there is um, where they land people to service the, the gears and the thing in the nautical uh, from helicopters. And the next generation are going to 15 megawatts will have helicopter landing pads. And um, uh, the biggest ones will span um, um, about, I think it's 300, and, I think it's 300 meters or something like that. Um, uh, the Wright brothers' first flight was 65 meters. So the Wright brothers would be hopscotching across the wingspan of of these turbines, which is about four times bigger than the Airbus 380. And uh, the remarkable thing about these, they're made very, very tall, very, very, and they're being made more reliable. And so the new ones being now installed in Great, off the coast of Great Britain, 
will be turning 60% of the time, which also adds to the economics. And so you make them bigger and more reliable. All right, so it's all good news. Solar has plunged by about a factor of eight in six years. And so all good news, but it actually has to be twice as cheap as fossil in order for renewable to be competitive because as you go from 10 and 20 and 30 percent, California is now over 30 percent uh, solar, wind, hydro, mostly solar and wind, over 35 percent non-carbon. We're going to be at 50 percent by 2030. But as you go to 50, 60, 70 percent, it gets increasingly more expensive, and you need backup generation capacity to keep the lights on, keep the factories humming. You would need a very enhanced transmission distribution system, and you need energy storage, because wind and solar aren't on all the time. And so that is, then becomes part of the cost of renewables. At 5%, it's not really significant. But even 30% is beginning to be significant. 50%, very significant. All right, what is happening around the world? Well, this is China's high voltage AC. This is uh, up, up to a million volt lines in black and DC uh, in red. DC is much lower loss electricity transmission than AC, uh, much higher energy current capacity. This line from here to here is 3,100 kilometers. It's six gigawatts per wire, per pair of wires, six billion watts, and it loses less than 5% of the energy. Okay, so you don't even need superconducting. And it's getting cheaper than the smaller high voltage DC lines because of the capacity. And so uh, China now leads the world in high voltage long distance transmission. Now, the people live here, wind here, wind here, um, hydro here. And so they've embarked on big, building a very, very big system. Uh, energy storage, okay, here's my favorite battery. Uh, so the way it works is the following. When the wind blows 200 years ago, <laughs> you can pump water out of the ground and you store it here. And when you want the water, you open up the valve. But it, yeah, you pump the water, it's stored energy. What a great idea. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so uh, if you have, so this is hydroelectricity in the world. China leads. This is China that leads the world in hydroelectricity, followed by Brazil and then the United States and Canada. Um, what is China's plans? By 2020, they want to be up here. 2020 is only two years away, one year away now, one year and 30 months. So, uh, so by the end of 2020, they will have equal the rest of the world combined. OK, what else? This is pump storage. Believe it or not, Japan has lots of pump storage. They were very environmentally conscious because they have no fossil fuel. And, and so followed by the United States, China, and everything. And so what's happening? China's plans by uh, 2020, they will add 40 gigawatts of pump storage. And then by 2030, they will be over here, where that speaker is. Uh, again, more than the rest of the world combined. Now, the wonderful thing about pump storage is once you have the hydroelectric system, the cost of storing the energy, both in power and in energy, which is kilowatt hours, and as well as kilowatts, or megawatt hours and megawatts, um, is much, much bigger. Uh, the biggest uh, chemical storage battery system was uh, uh, installed by Tesla in Australia, and it was 100 megawatts. Okay, in technical terms, that's 0.1 gigawatts. <laughs> so if you look at these numbers, and that cost about $350 per kilowatt hour. So you multiply 350 <laughs> kilowatt hours by 100 megawatts, you get a very, very big number. The pump storage cost after the hydroelectric dam is built is 1 20th, roughly 1 20th the cost, and very reliable, and actually very efficient. If you pump water down at the base of the dam or in interlocking dams and pump it back up, the round-trip efficiency, all the friction losses, um, 
are about 85% uh, efficient. So it's actually more efficient than a flow battery. Not as efficient as a lithium ion battery. They're about 95% efficient. So again, uh, that's why it's my favorite battery. OK. You also need really intelligent systems. It's going to be a very complex system. Already in California, it's getting to be very complex, where you're 35% uh, non-carbon emitting. And so you need machine learning. So this is a picture of uh, the Chinese champion uh, playing a computer called AlphaGo. And he, um, since Go was invented in China, they were broadcasting it with live feed in China during the match. And they cut it off in the middle because he broke down and started weeping <laughs> because it was not going well. And he knew enough pattern recognition, not as good as the machine, but enough pattern recognition he's being slaughtered. <laughs> And so, it, uh, and he says, afterward, I play Go in my backyard while AlphaGo explores the universe. To remind you what they did, there's, there's like 10 to the, I don't know, 180, I don't know, it's a very big number, possibilities uh, in Go. And, and they did not program it by using expert analysis moves and things like that the way it was done in chess. They had the machine play itself. And when the machine lost, it kind of learned a little bit. And when the machine won, it learned a little bit. And it began to play itself faster and faster and faster, more and more and more. And then the year before he played it, I said, he looked at this when the machine built, beat the Korean champion. And he said, oh, I can beat this machine. You know, I looked at it way it's smooth. And then and he sees him next year and says, what, what happened? Well, the machine just got better because it played more often. In fact, it played so well and more often, the AlphaGo people, which was bought by Google, said, well, we proved our point. You know, no one's going to be able to touch this machine. So anyway, so off they go. Now, why am I telling you this? Because the same people who were in AlphaGo, they're in Great Britain, are actually being now employed by the national grid system to figure out how to do their electricity distribution in Great Britain for machine learning, unstructured machine learning. OK, so, uh, so because it's, it's getting to be in many, many areas better than the experts. And the experts don't like this at all because they're feeling a little bit displaced. So it's interesting to watch this happen. Electric vehicles, batteries. 2006, emerging electric vehicles, huge cost, $1,500 per kilowatt hour. This is an article written by. Bloomberg Energy Finance of projections of where battery costs will be. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we in Department of Energy, when I was there at the time, this is 2014, I was there at the end of 2013, uh, uh, we're projecting maybe we can get down to where this thing was, a little bit better than Bloomberg New Energy News. So Tesla Gigafactory's projection now uh, beginning to be a reality is that manufacturing costs are down here. Um, General Motors thinks uh, cell costs by 2022 would be here. So uh, this is 150 of the pack. So that's a factor of 10 drop in costs in this amount of time. Not quite as good as solar, but still coming down. And probably you're going to come down another factor of two, at least. Okay, So that's all good stuff. Um, I'm going to show you two forecasts, one made in 2015, one in 2016 for the electric vehicle sales from 2020 to 2040. The blue one was the 2015 forecast, and the red one was 2016. So this is about five times higher. And so you say, wow, what happened? Was there a big battery breakthrough? You know, there's incremental improvements in the cost of batteries, but you know, what's going on? And to impress upon you what is driving at least some of this, I'm going to take you back a century. And I'm going to take you back to New York City, 1900, Easter morning. And you look at this picture, and it's all horse-drawn carriages and people walking around and you know, parading their Easter finest. And there you have uh, uh, a horseless carriage in that little red circle. And um, 13 years later, Where's the horse? Well, 
there's one vehicle there, and uh, there's um, one horse here. <laughs> okay, this is one of the fastest technology transformations we've ever seen. Uh, and if you think about it, it was amazing because you needed entirely new infrastructure, uh, oil, gasoline supply chain, you need better roads, you need repair shops, you need filling stations. And to have this transformation in one and a half decades was remarkable. But what was accelerating this transformation in cities like New York was something else, and it was an environmental pollution problem. And the environmental pollution problems that were in 1880, there were 160,000 horses producing three to four million pounds of horse poop a day. And it was piling up everywhere. It was on the streets, and, it was piling, and they couldn't move out of the city fast enough. And so along came a cleaner solution, uh, because you know this is Easter Sunday, and, and, and so you're not zooming into the horse poop. And they cleaned it up for Easter. <laughs> uh, and so that's the difference, OK? And so what's the equivalent to today? This is Beijing on a bad air day. And what is happening is we're finding out that the smallest particulate matter, which in large part is due to coal burning and vehicle pollution, these are particles less than 2 and a half microns in diameter, are especially deadly. Uh, the biggest, uh, well, this is one of the biggest studies. I haven't looked in the last six months. It was uh, a meta-study uh, in Lancet Oncology, which is like the journal of, well, it's the cancer journal, the British journal. And they found for every five micrograms of PM2.5 per cubic meter, uh, the probability of getting lung cancer is about 18% higher. This was data taken in Great Britain, because there's not enough data in uh, high quality data in India or China. Uh, what's Beijing's air? It's actually improved. It used to be over 100 micrograms per cubic meter. It's now down to 76. But uh, that's a bigger than, this is a bigger number than that by a lot. And so, uh, so what's going on? Well, the World Health Organization guideline for what they consider clean air is less than 10 micrograms per cubic meter. But look. You don't consider a 36% higher chance of getting lung cancer clean air. So, so this is something that's shocking the medical community. Now, what about Delhi air? Well, it's about three or 400, average. So it's like smoking four or five packs of cigarettes per day from day zero, and everybody smokes, and you can't go inside and hide from it because the standard air filtration systems don't touch PM2.5. OK, what does get rid of PM2.5 are clean room HEPA filters or surgical room HEPA filters. OK, the bigger stuff is trapped. And that's the stuff that gives you a sore throat, but the stuff that really kills you. And by killing you, I mean, oops, I mean, uh, <laughs> um, he's my friend. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, I mean um, heart disease, stroke. It goes in this order. Heart disease, stroke, lung cancer, COPD. So lung cancer is actually third on the list of polluted air killers. And it takes 30, 40, 50 years to kill you. So if you've only been breathing for 10 or 20 years, you've just been getting to see uh, what's happening. And so in order to get, really get up there, you don't get heart disease or lung cancer in your first package of cigarettes. It, it takes a while. So, so the full impact is only, we're just beginning to see it. And, and it's, uh, it's very scary. All right, now I'm going to go about batteries. This is slightly, slightly out of order. And since I got back to Stanford, in addition to biology, biophysics, and biomedical stuff I'm doing, uh, I've begun to collaborate with him on batteries. <clears throat> and um, um, right now, the current energy density of batteries is something around 200, 250 watt hours per kilogram. Uh, and uh, depending on the battery, uh, so we've been working on silicon, but mostly lithium, metal, and uh, sulfur. And the hope is one can increase the energy density and charging rate fourfold. That's very important, because fourfold means 
the following. Instead of taking a couple of hours, right now the Tesla battery takes um, the fast charging 140 kilowatt thingy takes uh, 140 miles in 20 minutes. But the battery actually can, if you did that every day, it would be bad for the battery. Every week is probably okay, every month, not a problem. And so, but imagine you can charge 100, 140 miles in five minutes with a 300 mile range. Then you go back to a service station model. You don't need to wire your house for high voltage DC battery charger. Your employer doesn't have to do that. You don't tear up the streets because the cities can't afford that. But to run a few megawatt line to everything every kilometer or two is no problem. So the only way electric vehicles really go viral is if you get the battery charging problem fixed. And so that has helped me focus on that part. Whether we can get it, whether we're going to get it or someone else is going to get it, I don't know. But I think between five and 10 years, someone will get it. And then it goes viral. The cost is coming down nicely. And if you make it out of sulfur, it's going to be nearly, and lithium metal, we've also figured out how to recover lithium from salty water very, very cheaply. And so then this becomes a very, very cheap battery as well. But that's, you know, we're not there yet, but we'll see. Electrochemistry, two cents a kilowatt hour. What does it mean? It means, suppose electricity costs four, $40 a megawatt hour, four cents a kilowatt hour, how much electrical energy would you need in order to make a kilogram of hydrogen? Well, the electricity cost will be $1.50. But that's the market price of hydrogen today that's made from taking natural gas and turning it into hydrogen and CO2. You vent the CO2. So at four cents a kilowatt hour, it's a non-starter. You can't compete with natural gas uh, and vent the CO2 <clears throat> unless you have a very high price in carbon. Ah, two cents a kilowatt hour is totally different. Then the price of energy is only half. And if you can invent a low capex uh, way of doing it, this is going to be very good. And so we, um, uh, people are leaving, so I'm going to hurry this through. This is work of Jun Li. And I'm just going to skip this and remind you what hydrogen looks like, hydrogen production from electricity. Two electrodes with the proper catalyst in there. You pass electricity, out bubbles hydrogen and oxygen. And so these are the reactions. On one uh, electrode, you're taking water, turning your oxygen gas and protons and some electrons. And then the other loop, you're taking the protons plus the electrons from the wire and turning your hydrogen gas. Now let's look at what happens on this catalytic surface, both for hydrogen production and oxygen production. You're producing this gas in the form of hydrogens or oxygens. They're low solubility. They look around, they find each other, and they form a bubble. And then the bubble grows. And as the bubble grows, you have to supply the energy to overcome surface tension to make the bubble grow. And the bubble grows still more. And while it's doing this, it's blocking all the other catalytic sites. So bubbles are bad for electrochemistry. This is kind of maybe shocking, because electrochemists like to see bubbles and say, ah, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> if you make a porous substance and put the catalyst there with, let's say, 70% coverage, and these are little nano holes, it's really cheap polyethylene, hydrophobic, then the electrochemistry occurs on the surface, but the gases of oxygen, uh, oxygen and hydrogen can look around, and a few molecules away, they see an escape path, a gas escape path, or they can form a bubble. So what do they choose? They don't form bubbles. They just go out here. The electrochemistry is still here. Okay? And so if you and so this is what you do. You can stick this, you know, electrochemistry on this side and another on that side. Uh, we were thinking of keeping I'll skip that. You can ask me a question. <laughs> <laughs> we're not using pampers or or lab towels. The other thing we want is the geometry. So if you have something a few meters to 10 meters tall and separated by 100 microns, that's hence the little separator, uh, you can get essentially 3D electrochemistry. Uh, and it's very cheap. And let's see if I have it here. Yes. Uh, this is the electrochemistry with this cheap polymer. 
and at voltage you have a certain reaction rate, and it's four or five times slower. You have to put in four or five times more energy to get the same reaction. It's catalyst agnostic. So if someone invents a better catalyst, that too will work. So the importance of this is to say, what's the most important thing? It's the footprint of the electrochemical plant. And with cheap electricity, you lower the footprint. And by the way, a lot of people are making better catalysts. And so I think this too will become a reality. Now, I'm going to skip. Oh, I'm just going to skip the, because time is running out. But I just want to say this is a little bit out of date, uh, 38 gigatons of carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, 49. This is the amount of carbon dioxide fixed by agriculture and grazing land, more than twice. But it mostly gets recycled. 99.9% .9 gets recycled. So if you can take this agricultural residue and things, instead of letting the microbes recycle, turn into something useful, uh, you can do something. You also want to capture carbon dioxide from transportation fuels, cement, chemicals, plastics, ton, all these things. And so I'm going to skip how we can do this and just say that there's very, very innovative companies. This is the uh, natural materials that started with natural materials like wood and horn and rubber and things like that. And then when oil was discovered and developed, petrochemical industry developed, starting with bauxite and PVC and other plastics. And so now we're using this as a substitute for all these natural products because we got to find and you know, process oil. And it's the petrochemical industry is because it is from petrochemicals. M virtually all our plastics are from there. But more recently, you're finding uh, plastics can, can be made by other means, especially by biology, especially by biological residues. And so there's a company now trying to start with very, very high value chemicals, plastic films, to begin to take this carbon dioxide, the, the micro, microbes, to use the carbon residues of that. All right. In the end, what do we need to do? We've got to take CO2 and water. And we pump in energy, so we're going uphill in energy, electrochemically, thermochemically. And I told you how we're making hydrogen and oxygen. We're also making CO uh, very cheaply, much better, five times faster rate. Other people are working on this. Then from that, in, in principle, you can form a liquid hydrocarbon. And if you can do that, it would be very good. And it's because of this. And if you ask, how much does it cost to ship crude oil halfway around the world and store it on shore for up to six months, it turns out that the cost is two cents a gallon of gasoline. It is not in really, it's a, just a small fraction of the cost of gasoline. And so that's really remarkable. So think of the uh, Oil tankers are not the intercontinental, but the transcontinental energy transmission lines. Um, now, also, if you, before you get to the advanced hydrocarbons, can you ship and store oxygen, hydrogen around the world? And the answer is yes. But people are working on that intermediate step of taking something with a few benzene rings and hydrogenating them. And you can put stick six hydrogen atoms on this and this is the energy density uh, per unit weight on this axis, the energy density per unit volume. And this is what you can store in the density. And this is what you can store if you cooled hydrogen to 20 degrees Kelvin to liquefy it. It's the same. And so this energy density is comparable to liquefied natural gas. And so if you can ship it in a liquid organic temperature carrier at room temperature, which is what we're talking about, then it becomes very cheap shipping. Liquefied natural gas has to go very fast. And you can't keep it liquefied in storage. Uh, it just costs too much money. So if you can keep this liquefied at room temperature, and then you release it and get back your hydrogen when you want it, you can transform it. And you could get to a partial hydrogen economy. All right, so I just want to end by reminding you of one of my favorite pictures, taken Christmas Eve, 1968. It's called Earthrise. Uh, this is 
moon. And um, this is Earth, just in case you <laughs> are an engineer. No. <laughs> uh, and the astronaut who took the picture said, we came all this way to explore the moon. And the most important thing is we've discovered the Earth. And you look at this picture, and that really puts it into perspective. This is not a good place to live. If you lived on the surface of the moon, you will die of a lethal dose of radiation very, very quickly. This, from this vantage point, looks really good. And even on a cold autumn day in New England, it looks pretty good. <laughs> Uh, forget about going to Mars. In transit to Mars, you get a lethal dose of radiation. And like the moon, there's no air to breathe. So it's kind of like settling in the new world, except no air, no water, and you get a lethal dose of radiation. Otherwise, it's OK. <laughs> and there's no, so there's nowhere else to go. So since 1968, we've discovered that we are indeed changing the climate of the Earth. It is due to humans. And, uh, and we're going in a bad direction, but that with policy and technology and science, you can maybe still save uh, future generations. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Questions. I'd just like to present uh, Professor Chu. Thank you. With the uh, Hoyt Hoddle Revere Silver Plate. So you can take a little bit of New England back home to Stanford with you. All right. And uh, thank it's you. our tradition for the Hoddle Lecture. But thank you again for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Um, I wanted to note that we're going to actually pass the microphones around. And uh, uh, we have Malin and Barbara on either side holding the mic. So. Uh, raise your hand and we will get to you. Do we have one right here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting talk, talk, Prof. Um, I just um, retrieved some information from the Renewable Energy Policy Network report in 2014. It reported that about 19.2% of the world consumption energy is contributed by the renewable energy, and 14% out of it is contributed by the biomass. So I just want to know what is your insight on the biomass share on this renewable energy, since your slide is not really covered on the biomass side. Well, I, I thought I... I tried to, um, that uh, the biomass side has to do with biomass in terms of agriculture, which was we, we, we exploit agriculture and we also grow crops to feed animals that we end up eating. And so, uh, and so the greenhouse gas effect of those, that sector is profound. And that was what I was talking about when I was showing you the pictures of um, the amount of land under production, the amount uh, that the beef, for example, takes about a factor of 10 more land slash energy inputs uh, to create the food we eat. Uh, you can't, and, and so it is a huge impact. Uh, the numbers you quoted were slightly different than the numbers I use. I, I have the sources in my talk of the numbers I use. Um, uh, you know, usually things like, you know, UN, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, IPCC, things like that that are, are meta-studies. Okay, and I try to stay away from blogs <laughs> and other things which are notoriously unreliable. Um, but as I said, the agricultural sector, the food sector, is some of the lowest hanging fruit. If you tradition, transition to uh, low tillage practices, you uh, genetically modify the microbes and the crops. Uh, you, can, you can still feed the world. Uh, you're not going to, I don't think the United States is in a position to tell the rest of the developing world and developed world, eat as much meat as we do. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, um, and you, too, can suffer from heart disease and stroke like we do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Uh, I think uh, you, people eventually have to make their own choices, which also are influenced by uh, their impact on the world. Now, in, as I learn more about how we raise plants and animals, it's getting kind of gross to me what we do to, you know, a turkey can't go full bone. It, it can't even stand up if it reaches adulthood. They're so Frankenstein turkeys. Okay, just think about that. Not only can they not mate, they can't even go to adulthood to stand up. And so, so what we've done to plants and animals is, is really profound. And what we've done to the planet is profound. And so I, that was what I was talking about. So I hoped I was addressing that. So did I, did I miss your question? Yeah, I just, I just want to look at the second generation of the uh, biomass renewable energy where we don't consume the food, but we consume on the um, biomass waste, like the crops, waste, and so oh, on. Oh, no, no, very much, I'm sorry, um, very much part of this, all the residues of the crops, the stalks, the stems, and everything, you want to actually take those and turn them into, uh, recycle them. And, uh, and that's what I was talking about, uh, what I was talking about, actually recycling them and these bioplastics, biochemicals, biomaterials, and eventually biofuels. Um, biofuels is the hardest because uh, the cost of oil at $80 a barrel is still pretty tough. And I don't think it'll ever go to $200 a barrel in the near term future. Uh, so, so I think it is all the agricultural waste and residue from all that roughage, you know, cellulose stuff, hemicellulose, lignin stuff that, that we want to convert into the valuable stuff. It's very important, by the way, to, even though petrochemicals is like 10, 15% of the use of oil today, it's 50% of the profit. So in order to leave the oil and gas in the ground, if you find a better substitute for the chemicals and plastics, it's much less valuable, okay? So part of, you know, part of what I want to do is, uh, and I urge you to all think about it, uh, is to figure out a way to get substitutes based on recyclable stuff like things you grow. Uh, then you devalue the oil and gas, and so it stays in the ground because it's not, it's not economical to pull it out of the ground. And that's ultimately what it's going to take. Even with a price of $80 a ton, you need the $80 or $60 a ton so you don't throw pollution in the atmosphere. But the rest of this stuff, you also just need better technical solutions. So, okay. Thank you. Hi, Professor. Um, thanks for the great talk. Um, I was kind of curious. Um, so, at the United Nations, we're seeing that a lot of the um, largest climate issues are coming from are the largest contributors to climate change are these developing countries. I was wondering if you had a view on what sort of organizations would actually bring this technology to the developing world. So are you saying, are you thinking more foreign governments, American companies with foreign subsidiaries um, or Yeah, okay, good, companies? yeah, good question. So, so uh, the other was a good question too. So, so um, <laughs> I, I'm just, um, uh, it's very important that you, uh, make technology available. Uh, it's again driven by money and cost and developing countries do want to develop and bring prosperity to the people. And for the poorest countries, uh, energy consumption and uh, getting out of poverty are very intimately tied. Once you get to the difference between Japan, Denmark, the United States, and Saudi Arabia, it's flat. <laughs> the standard of living stops increasing, although it can vary by more than a factor of 10 or 20. Uh, so, so the good news is because um, solar in, in more remote areas, uh, people are beginning to think very seriously about what we call leapfrogging past uh, a totally uh, national grid system that could probably be a hybrid of a grid system with um, remote areas, especially ones where you can only truck in bunker fuel and diesel fuel. Uh, having uh, local generation, typically solar and a battery. But the batteries still are expensive, but that's happening. But they also need to work in an unprotected, non-cooled environment. And so in South Asia, Africa, that's another issue. If you take a Tesla and park it in a Phoenix garage for a week, 
you come back to a completely, not only dead battery, destroyed battery. Because the Tesla will use the battery to keep it cool, but after it can't keep it cool, it warms up and the chemistry destroys the battery. And so you cannot have that in, uh, in uh, South Asia and Africa. And so that is actually happening. There are battery chemistry technologies like with ionic liquids where they don't need a cool environment. So all these things are part of this technology you need in order to get it. The other thing is, in the end, you might want to need a backup in the form of diesel fuel. But if you think about what people use electricity for, pumping water, disinfecting water, operating their cell phone, that's got a battery in it. Pumping water, holding water, that's your battery. Uh, a fan, you're not going to run air conditioning off a of battery. Um, uh, a small refrigerator, ah, the refrigerator. Now, in, in developing countries, they don't have 22 cubic foot refrigerators and freezers. They have little guys. And so if you take this much of a little guy and put a block of ice in it slash water and have it slightly better insulated, you can go without uh, electricity for a day or two, and it still keeps the free. And most people don't care more than a day or two. And so all of a sudden, you realize that when you had cheap electricity on tap whenever you wanted it, we got into habits, just as we no longer use windmills and pumping water. <laughs> And now, all of a sudden, you have to think back in the time we didn't have that and think of all that we have. And, and LED lights, for those of you who bicycle at night, you find that there's a very bright light LED, very, very efficient. So the things are being transformed. So the, that's the good news. Then, yes, the village can have a diesel generator and backup. But the cost of that electricity is all in the operating cost. The diesel generator is nothing. And the cost is much, much more expensive than solar plus modest battery and sensible use of electricity. So, so I am optimistic, but you've got to convince people that it's going to work, that they're robust, they don't need to be repaired every two years and a few other things. And the people who sell diesel generators and diesel fuel are trying to convince the same group of people that solar is so unreliable that you don't want that. So that's inertia. That's what we call, it's a very biological reaction. You know, the, that the older industries are trying to survive. And so the antibodies come out. <laughs> and so the antidote to that is uh, information and local success that spreads by word of mouth. And, and, but the technology, it's also foundation is the technology which is getting better as well. Hi, uh, my, my question is sort of follows up right on what you just said. Um, it seems like either the technology is already largely ready for the solutions or it's getting close or will be close soon. But as you just said, there's an inertia to adopting the new technology. Um, and we could easily diverge into a political discussion or a psychological discussion. But I'm curious, are there examples I mean, you gave the example of the, the horse poop, but are, are there other examples where um, something in society is, is so sort of vested and controlled and unhealthy and hard to change? I mean, I guess smoking yeah. maybe is no, an example. No, no, air pollution. Um, China is subsidizing electric vehicles. Two-thirds of the cost of electric vehicle in China is paid by the government, number one. Number two, if you want to buy an internal combustion engine car, you might have to wait a year in a major city Shanghai, Beijing. You get it instantly if you buy an electric vehicle. Number three, two-wheelers and three-wheelers are outlawed in the major cities today. It can only be electric. And, uh, and so, and they're pouring, unfortunately, very large sums of money into battery research in electric vehicles. It's unfortunate because it will be an oversupply, just like there was an oversupply for you know, five to 10 years of solar, so the market crashed. But now it's recovered, and the, the remaining companies are making money making solar. So I think there will be an overinvestment in electric vehicles. Um, but that will work its way through the system. Uh, meanwhile, the technology is going to get better. So it's still, we still need the fast charging, without a doubt. Um, and we, uh, and we, it needs to be about three-fold lighter so that the Battery and electric motor weighs less than or equal to a 
1.6 liter internal combustion engine, engine plus transmission. And when you get much lighter weight, you don't have to use as much battery to lug around the battery. So it's a very nice process, a virtuous circle. So, but what's driving this huge subsidy? And similar things I'm beginning to see accelerate in India. It's air pollution. So it really is like the horse poop of the 21st century. Thanks. So, so, so just to follow up quickly, the, the scenario is that, the, that China and, and countries which adopt the better technology for, in regard to climate for other reasons, for the pollution reason, once, they, once enough of that is adopted, then countries like the U.S., which aren't you know, going in the right direction, will just economically be forced to well, adopt no, the same no, technology? How, how will the, the U.S. is still such a huge emit, emitter. Yeah. So let's talk about it. Suppose you do have a car that goes $25,000 without subsidy, $20,000 without subsidy, you, uh, and you can do a filling station model. And, and uh, oh, by the way, uh, the cost of owning the car is far less because the energy cost is uh, one quarter. The cost of owning a car after the first five or six years is maintenance and fuel costs. But the maintenance is virtually zip compared to an internal combustion engine car. You know, I own a 17-year-old car that has a little warning light. Time to take it to your local dealer uh, so they can, because the dealer wants to make another mortgage payment on the house. It's an old BMW. <laughs> and, and, um, and so you're many, many thousands of dollars. They, most of the repair shops make their money. It's not our repair shops. Most of the automobile dealers make their money by servicing cars, not by selling cars. Most of the gasoline stations, the majority, not most, all the gasoline stations in the developed world make more money by selling candy bars and soda and stuff like that than fuel. The fuel is just a weak excuse to get you into the shop so you can buy some of this junk. And if, I don't know, in California, I don't know about in, in Boston, but in California, the fuel pumps, for the, ostensibly for the sake of better meter and accuracy, pump slower. <laughs> I don't, uh, and so it takes about four minutes to fill up a 15, 16 gallon tank, or it used to be two minutes. Why do they want to do it? I've cleaned the windshield, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. <laughs> They want you to go in and buy something, but they don't want you to spend 20 minutes because it blocks the next customer. So four or five minutes seems to be about the right time. Hence, the engineering goal, <laughs> while <clears throat> your car is filling up, you're, 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 your char is charging, you're discharging, and you still might have time to buy something. <laughs> it's just physics talk. It's <laughs> okay. Well, there are two. There seem to be one and two. Sure. Um, I'll be you. short. I'll be shorter. Thank you. Thank well, you not shorter. I don't want to be any shorter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be quicker. Um, my question to you is about nuclear energy. And I noticed you didn't nuclear mention energy. Yeah. nuclear energy yeah. in your talk. Hold, hold. Um, sure. My question is about nuclear energy. I know it's become contentious in some places like California. I wondered what your opinion is on what role nuclear energy must play in addressing sure. climate change? Okay, so uh, my, my, in my humble opinion, I think that the last third of electrical energy and process heat has to come from energy on demand. And there are going to be two sources, fossil or nuclear. The last third, not the first third. And that, yeah, I stress that, <laughs> okay? Uh, so you don't need it for the, you know, when you're 30 or 50 percent, you don't need nuclear. But you do need something for the last third. So which is it going to be? Which is the better, lesser of two evils? And what's the cost? It's going to be the cost of Sox, Nox, Mercury, particulate matter, and um, stuff like that, uh, and carbon dioxide for fossil. And the nuclear is the cost of not being able to build them on time on budget, plus uh, uh, the uh, spent fuel costs, plus uh, proliferation risks. Uh, far more dangerous uh, to people. Uh, fossils, not a comparison. I mean, it's like 10,000, not 10,000, but at least 1,000 to one. 
There are studies that show these ridiculous ratios before the PM 2.5 stuff was known. <laughs> you know, nuclear versus that. So the, 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 the cost of human health, there's no comparison. Uh, the emotional stuff, uh, emotionally impulsed people are more scared of things they don't fully understand than something sure to kill them. It just happens to be true. And so that's one of the issues that um, either we have leaders that help educate <laughs> or else we go into where we're going. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I would say uh, that the last third of process heat and electricity generation and things like that should come from energy on demand. And I see nuclear as a better choice. Thank you for coming in today. Uh, you emphasize the importance of lithium ion batteries in the transportation sector and with storage in general. What are your thoughts on where lithium will be coming from in the long run, and also the end of the life cycle with lithium ion batteries? Yeah. OK, so very quickly, we have to start to make uh, many, many things, including uh, batteries, uh, whether the lithium ion or mangane mang magnesium or whatever, recyclable. Uh, where does lithium come from? Right now, it comes from ores and from very salty brines, lakes, uh, which they then evaporate for about a year. So the cheapest lithium is from these very, very salty lakes. And they evaporate, and they recover it using chemical processes. So we, Yi Tsui and I, and Chung Lu, who left our groups, who's now a beginning assistant professor at University of Chicago, figured out a way to use electrochemistry to get lithium from much less salty water, much less salty than you don't have to evaporate. You can actually, the, when you actually drill for oil, you get oil and gas, but the thing you mostly get is salty water. And in Texas, uh, Oklahoma, it could be a 50 to 1 ratio. It can be almost as 100 to 1, at least 10 to 1, salty water. That salt water has enough fraction of lithium in it that you can actually economically extract it. Um, and I, an advisor, I'm the Shell Science Council, so I advise Shell. So I'm telling about you know, what we're doing. And I said, this is amazing because lithium sells for, eh, depending on what the markets are doing, but let's say 10 to $20 per kilogram. That's much, much more expensive than oil. And it could become a day I said, you drill, you get this oil and gas, but I want the lithium. <laughs> and you stick the oil and gas back in the ground. Uh, <laughs> and so they gave us a sample of this stuff. We haven't run the, the sample yet, because we want to know how clean it has to get before you have little trace hydrocarbons that poison uh, the, the stuff. So, but, but I, I'm, and, oh, the cost. 10 to $20 a kilogram uh, electricity cost in today's electricity, five cents to four cents a kilowatt is 50 cents worth of energy, to maybe 80 cents, OK? So the cost, when you're, when you're competing against $15 kilogram stuff, there's no, there's no issue with electrochemistry. If you're competing with $1 kilogram stuff, then the cost of energy really matters. And so it's a whole, but then that also says, to all the chemists here and chemical engineers, look to electrochemistry. We bank on cheap electricity in good places where it's cheap. Iceland, you know, abundant and cheap and clean. And then, and if it's cost effective, I mean, shipping doesn't cost anything. You can ship it anywhere. And so we think the lithium will, it, it will increase the uh, supplies about 10,000 fold <clears throat> from what we think uh, and, and so without that, you know, we start running, you know, the price of lithium starts to go up and, you know, we might have a couple hundred years. But long before it's, we're depleted, it starts to rise and then the market responds and you get, find more lithium, things like that. Cobalt's a much more serious problem, okay? Uh, cobalt is found where there's nickel and iron, <laughs> but it's much rarer. Lithium in abundance is equal to that in the Earth's crust is the same as chlorine and nitrogen, OK? There's lots of lithium. It was just separating it. And now there's lots of salty water. So we got that one licked. 
Cobalt's a different problem. Uh, and you know the, um, the financial community have given so much to the world are from trying to corner the market in lithium and cobalt futures. And my goal is to make sure they lose money. 